The Mecklenburg County election debates are a service of WTVI, Mecklenburg County, and the League of Women Voters of Charlotte Mecklenburg. The views and opinions expressed in these debates are those of the candidates and do not necessarily represent the views of WTVI, its management, Mecklenburg County, or the League of Women Voters. PBS Charlotte and the League of Women Voters present Election Debate 2016. Hello, I'm Jeff Rivenbark with PBS Charlotte. Welcome to the 2016 general election debate sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Charlotte Mecklenburg. During the next 20 minutes, you'll hear from two candidates in the NC State Senate District 39 race. Questions for today's debate were provided by the League of Women Voters of Charlotte Mecklenburg. The candidates were not given the questions in advance. I'll call on the candidates in random order and you will have 30 seconds to respond. If you would like to challenge an opponent, you can raise your yellow card. You will have 30 seconds to respond. Each candidate has three challenges during this debate and they will be allowed to make a 30 second closing statement. And now let's meet the two candidates for NC Senate District 39, Republican Dan Bishop and Democrat Lloyd Schur. Gentlemen, you. good to have you here. Our first question is, does the legislature have any role to play in diffusing situations like the recent protest and ten racial tension in Charlotte? Why or why not? Mr. Bishop, we begin with you. Well, thank you, Jeff, and I appreciate the League of Women Voters allowing us the opportunity and WTVI to be here today. Uh, I, you know, I think the recent event in Charlotte that we're talking about would be something that's appropriate for local control to be exercised, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a core responsibility of city government. Uh, to the extent the legislature can play a role, uh, I'm glad to uh, cooperate in that. Thank you. Mr. Lloyd Sure. Well, I think there are areas that the legislators can cooperate. We could look at housing. We could look at education. That's part of the problem within the African-American community that we need to follow up. We look at putting together a group of people from out this community and encourage this and do a weekend retreat where we talk to everyone in open communications. Maybe that is where we as legislators can do. Thank you, Mr. Schur. I think we have a challenge for Mr. Bishop. Well, I certainly agree, uh, Lloyd, that, uh, that we all want to work on, and there are a variety of problems to be worked on. You've mentioned some good ones, and I think we can work together on those issues, but what I was referring to about the local issue uh, that, that was asked by the moderator is that uh, in Charlotte, the responsibility needs to rest very firmly on executive leadership here to make sure that when you have a matter that challenges public order, the mayor and the city manager do the response. And in this particular case, uh, unfortunately, our mayor failed to call in the National Guard, failed to do what government first needs to do, which is preserve order. Uh, and so by keeping those lines of responsibility clear, we'll avoid problems like that, hopefully in the future. Thank you. Our second question is, where do you stand on House Bill 972, enacted by the legislature to prohibit release of body cam videos without a cam order, a court order rather. So again, the question is, where do you stand on House Bill 972 enacted by the legislature to prohibit release of body cam videos without a court order? Mr. Lloyd Sure. Thank you. I actually believe the body cam should be released, but after an investigation is completed. You don't want to affect someone's legal rights by releasing videos early. But I think to make the community understand and see what transpired and to be transparent, we do need to release the uh, videos. And I think that's one of the things that, remember, these are tax dollars that pay for that. These are tax dollars. We need to protect the uh, videos, but at the same time, the rights of the individual. Thank All right. you. All right, Mr. Bishop, your response. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Lloyd, I agree with you. Now. Uh, and, and that's a good, a good point for us to note because House Bill 972, the, the question's actually not accurate. It says that it prohibits the release of, of body cam uh, footage. It created rules where there were none. So many localities were treating that information as, as a personnel record and couldn't be released at all. What the law did was to allow 
anyone who's depicted in the video to see the video automatically and it allows the, the uh, uh, police department or city to go to and get a court order to release the rest. But I agree with Lloyd, you don't want to release those in every instance before you've had an investigation. Thank you. We have a little bit of a follow-up question to that. Do you believe police officers should be required to turn their body cams on when responding to a call? Uh, Mr. Bishop, we go back to you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I can't imagine a reason not to do that. Uh, body cameras in general are good information uh, and, uh, and, I, and it should be policy as far, now I'm not an expert in law enforcement, so that question would probably be best put to, to uh, law enforcement, but my, my instinct for it is that yes, uh, body cameras should be on anytime someone's engaged in police work in the field. Thank you. Mr. Lloyd Shearer. Well, I happen to agree. When you come out of that car, your body cam should automatically be done. There are things that could be, possibly be done an automatic or turn on by camera when you turn on your switches. That's what's a possibility so that your camera is already on when you go to a site or go to a location. But we've got to protect the police officer and that body cam does that as well. So we've got to make sure that they use it and they use it appropriately and make sure that we are taking care of the police officer at the same time using the body cams. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Our next question is, even though the North Carolina Constitution gives the legislature the power to overrule local ordinances, are they abusing that power with recent actions like House Bill 2? Please explain your response, Mr. Bishop. Well, that's a loaded question. Uh, it sounds like somebody's got a point of view who wrote the question, but I'm glad to have the chance to answer it because it actually is incorrect in its premise as well. Uh, it's not that the legislature has the right to override decisions of localities. It's that localities only have powers that the state legislature grants them. And in the case of HB2, it responded to an, a situation where the city of Charlotte attempted to exercise a power that it didn't have. In the course of doing so, it uh, overrode, it subjected to risk uh, basic constitutional rights to privacy that people have in intimate facilities, most importantly school children. Thank so you. That's, uh, that's uh, something the legislature's responsibility is always to protect those rights and if a city steps beyond its authority then it's got to be Thank correct. You. Thank you. Mr. Lloyd Schur? Well I disagree with Bish Representative Bishop on this. HB2 took away the rights of individuals, minorities, LGBTQ people. Had there been discussion with this bill, there might have been other alternatives, maybe locking doors in bathrooms or locking stalls or providing privacy showers, which are done, I know, in the organization I go to, that happens. Did the legislator? Absolutely, they overstepped. That's where we have problems. They didn't just overstep here. They overstepped in New Hanover County, Wake County, Guilford County, and others All in right. changing legislators or council districts. Thank you, sir. Uh, and we have a challenge, I think, for Mr. Bishop. You know, uh, my friend's ally, the, the editorial board at The Observer, wrote about HB2, yes, the thought of uh, male genitalia in girls' locker rooms and vice versa might be distressing to some, but the battle for equality has always been in part about overcoming discomfort. Now, that's a radical point of view. It, what, I was the person who stepped forward before the city council acted with its reckless action and said, this is unwise, let's discuss it, let's figure out what to do. They didn't do that and they precipitated a controversy that we've all paid for. Thank you. Mr. Lloyd Shear. Well, Representative Bishop didn't consult anyone either. He wrote the bill and it was done in less than 24 hours. The problem is, is that HB2 is more than just a bathroom bill. If he wanted a bathroom bill, then why not discuss what would protect people in the bathroom and not go for an overkill, not take away people's rights? That was done. The city council, the county commissioners, as an eight-year county commissioner, we have responsibilities to pass ordinances and rules and laws for local residents. That was taken away by HB2. All right, thank you. Our next question is, would you support an independent commission redistricting legislative and congressional districts? Why or why not, Mr. Lloyd Sure, I would. I think we've got to end the one party rule over in any party, whether it's Democrat or Republican. We need to give public, the citizens, an opportunity to have competition. I kind of feel it would be great if everyone was an independent and then we ran as independents, but unfortunately we can't. 
So I would look to a commission that would recreate. I know I'm running a deeply Republican district, and I know you have that advantage. But you know what? We've been out walking it, and we've talked to the people, and they want to see independent uh, districts. Thank you. Mr. Bishop, your response. Um, you know, I think the responsibility to uh, draw districts is vested in the legislature by the Constitution. I don't think the buck ought to be passed. And in fact, if you want to hold someone responsible for the drawing of, of districts or any other legislation, the place to turn is the legislature that you've elected. Uh, so there, and, and the notion that you, when you have independent, supposedly independent redistricting, you, you uh, sh take politics out can be belied by a lot of things. There's a great series of articles on ProPublica, which is a sort of a left-wing website about the independent redistricting in California, which is as, as left-wing as could possibly be. Thank you for your response. Our next question is, citizens demand tax cuts, but also demand better education, health care, roads, technology improvement, et cetera. How do you balance these conflicting demands? Mr. Bishop, we begin with you. Well, uh, the first and uh, foremost responsibility of government is public safety, and, and after that, for state government, it's education. Education is a constitutional commitment, but in order to meet all of our responsibilities, it is critical for the General Assembly to have policies that yield a great performing economy, and we've made remarkable strides in doing that. Uh, we have the top performing economy in the country in gross domestic product. Just information that came out in mid-September says we've had the highest gains, fastest growth rate in the country in median personal, median household income in the past three years. Thank you. Mr. Lloyd Schur? Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, the question's about funding and making sure that we fu fully fund education. It should be the first budget item done by the state house and senate. So that way the county commissioners and the school boards can pass their budgets in a timely manner. We've got a responsibility here. We're not paying teachers enough. They claim that they've raised and paid more in education than ever before, but that's not a true statement. We've got more teachers, more students, and we have to spend more to cover education. So that's part of the problem. We've got to spend the money for education. Thank you. Our next question is, do you favor the establishment of a dedicated state funding source for the North Carolina Housing Trust Fund? Mr. Lloyd Shearer, back to you. Yes, I do. I think we need to improve housing uh, throughout North Carolina, and the way to do that is through a housing fund. If we do that, similar to what we've done with roads and similar to what we've done with other areas of the state, uh, in other capacities, we need to do something similar. We need to help with housing. We need to build affordable housing and the state can participate in that. And through county, city government, state government, we can help develop that. And a housing fund would go well to do that. Thank you. Again, the question, do you favor the establishment of a dedicated state funding source for the North Carolina Housing Trust Fund? Mr. Dan Bishop. I don't have a particular position on that. I'm open to considering it. I will say that to the extent one establishes a dedicated fund, one's talking about move, moving something out of the question of prioritization that Lloyd just spoke to. So the top priority being uh, education, yeah, what we've said as the priorities the last three years in a row is to improve teacher pay. We've improved teacher pay more than any other state in the country. Uh, and so. Uh, it, it, I, you can't contradict yourself. If you, you, can, you can't have it both ways. All right, thank you. I think we have a challenge for Mr. Lloyd Shear. Yeah, we have increased teacher pay. We've gone from about 48th to about 47th or 45. So that's not much of improvement. Teachers are leaving at an alarming rate out of the school system. That is a problem. The question I have is this. If you're going to pay teachers, pay them all. Last year, they raised teacher salary for new teachers, but everyone else got a $750 bonus. That's not taking care of our teachers. That's not taking care of our education system. That's where you failed. Thank you. And we have a challenge for Mr. Bishop, your third challenge. Uh, Lloyd, uh, the problem with teacher pay is not uh, the amount that we've increased it over the past three years. Again, that's the most in the nation. The problem with teacher pay is that when your party was running state government, teacher pay fell from 19th in the country to 44th. So we're making strides to bring that back, just like it was the eighth worst economy in the world in the uh, in the in the country, uh, uh, and you know we've uh, corrected that as well. So 
We're making strides. You cut a billion, $1.54 billion Democrats did from education in 2009. And we have another challenge, the last challenge for Mr. Lloyd Shear. That was his last? Your last challenge as well. The question I have is this, Representative Bishop. You say we're te doing what we can for education, and you're talking about teacher salary, but you've got to understand the teachers are not being treated fairly. They're not getting the respect from the state, from the students, from the parents. And that's part of our responsibility to make sure we give them our children to teach and we don't give them the funding to do it. Teachers pay out of their pocket every year to cover. And as a former teacher, that's wrong. Thank you, Mr. Schur. Our it, next question is... a challenge to me that I'm supposed to respond to. No, you're, you're, out, of, card. you're out of challenges now. No, no, no. He, you're out of challenges, okay. yes. I see. I, I thought he got asked for everybody. Our next question is, does it make sense not to expand Medicaid when North Carolina loses federal tax dollars, health insurance coverage for more people, and more jobs in the health industry? Please explain your position. Mr. Bishop, we go to you first, sir. Well, that's almost another talking point for the Democratic Party. I, 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 I need to talk to the person who wrote the questions. Um, you know, uh, we have uh, the Obamacare, uh, Affordable Care Act has been anything but and we're seeing uh, the individual market crater around the country, including where in here in North Carolina where we have Blue Cross Blue Shield having lost $400 million. Those who have favored expanding the uh, Medicaid, uh, and they say at the cost of federal government, but there are state costs that are, uh, in fact, very substantial state costs that have to be done administratively in a portion of the program in due course. That's not the fix. We need to go back and fix what has been destroyed. All right, thank you, sir. Mr. Lord Schur. Thank you. I do believe the state needs to accept those funds. That is federal money. That's money that people pay in on taxes and pay in on their uh, payroll taxes and everything else. But here's the thing. So far, you've blamed the Democrats for three things, Representative Bishop. The Democrats aren't in control. I am tired of picking on parties. Why not walk across the line and work with other parties? That's what I want to do. When I go to Raleigh, I want to see Medicaid, and I want to see how we can set it up to make it fair for everyone. Thank you. Our next question is, would you reinstate the North Carolina Refundable Earned Income Tax Credit to give working families a tax break and thus a boost to the local economy? Why or why not, Mr. Lloyd Sure. Well, I would. Anytime we can provide a tax break for a family or for people that they can then turn around and spend money in other capacities, which helps with other jobs, helps with purchases, and, and so on, expresses itself. But an earned tax income credit would benefit people and that would help them be able to save some money on taxes and at the same time be able to spend a little more. Mr. Bishop? Let me tell you what uh, the Ma Republicans did when we resume, became the majority in Raleigh in 2011. Over opposition of the governor, in fact, we had to override a veto to accomplish it. Uh, we cut a penny out of the sales tax. The sales tax is the tax that most significantly affects people who are of poor uh, or middle income status. They got an, a billion dollar uh, tax cut, most of which went to them. That's direct uh, tax relief. Now, as to the earned income tax credit, it has unfortunately been beset by fraudulent use, and so it's not nearly as direct a, 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 a help as the cut in the sales tax that we've already done. All right, gentlemen, our very last question for this debate, who are you supporting for president? Mr. Dan Bishop. I support Donald Trump. Uh, you know, I didn't vote for Mr. Trump in the primary, but millions of people have, have uh, selected him as the Republican uh, nominee, and I support the nominee. Unfortunately, the, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton has had a long history of corruption. Uh, her, her handling of her, of her uh, Senate, or excuse me, Secretary of State responsibilities, the way she handled her email, the way she sold access through uh, uh, to the Clinton Foundation, uh, there's a, just a trail of corruption that's got to stop, and I think Trump will do it. Thank you. Mr. Lloyd Sure. I'm supporting Hillary Clinton, and I'll tell you why. All the things that Representative Bishop just said have been said over and over and over for years. She's never been charged. There's never been any problems. Secondly, you want to talk about foundation problems? I don't see anywhere where the Clintons bought a $20,000 picture of themselves to hang in their, one of their offices. That's a violation of foundations. What I have to expect 
I expect my president to be one that when they go up there, they're going to be secure and I'm going to feel secure. I won't be secure with Donald Trump. All right. And now it's time for closing statements. And we begin with Mr. Dan Bishop. Thanks, sir. Um, we've got North Carolina moving in the right direction. If we can get the federal government uh, to uh, change policies sufficiently so that the national economy stops stagnating as it has for the past eight years, uh, then the position that we're in is truly remarkable. Uh, we're seeing uh, that North Carolina is becoming an economic, uh, rising economic power. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier the, the fastest growth in GDP, the fastest uh, growth in median household income. Those are remarkable numbers. And, uh, and North Carolina has great prospects ahead if we can just get some changes in Washington. Thank you. Mr. Lloyd Schur. Well, the first change we got to do is repeal HB2 so we can bring businesses, film, count, film business and stuff back to North Carolina. That's the first thing we need to do. Um, I will say this, our economy is not going in the right direction. I'm looking to change how we do things in Raleigh. I want to cross party lines. I understand it's a Republican district, but I'm asking you, have you voted Republican just because you're a Republican? Maybe it's time to look at an alternative that's willing to do something different. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, Republican Dan Bishop and Democrat Lloyd Schur are the candidates in the North Carolina Senate District 39 race. Gentlemen, thanks for taking part today. You can find more information about the League of Women Voters at Charlotte Mecklenburg by going to their website at goleaguego.org. You can also find more information about the candidates at vote411.org. If you're a Mecklenburg County resident, please remember uh, voting. early voting begins uh, this week, Thursday, October 20th. The general election is Tuesday, October the 8th, and the polls will remain open that day until 7.30 in the evening. I'm Jeff Reivenbark from all of us at PBS Charlotte. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.